Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Critical Praxis Week 9. I'm Nico Wood, and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about posthumanism. Um, first of all, I'd really like to thank Benny for putting this together and for asking me to contribute. I'm very passionate about posthumanism, and I'm excited to share a few of my thoughts. So, what I'm going to do is actually talk a little bit about what posthumanism means sort of generally. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think it means, and then I'm going to talk about how I've used it in some of my work. So to start off with, um, I know that we asked you to read the Nicholas Gain article, and I think it's a really succinct explanation of posthumanism. I do admit that most of my kind of central ideas about what posthumanism mean come out of Robert Pepperell's work. And Pepperell is cited quite a bit in the Gain article. And this is Pepperell's main book. It's called uh, The Posthuman Condition. And it's probably my favorite book on the subject. And so I like to use Robert Pepperell's definition of posthumanism, which is cited in the Gain article and which has three elements to it. And so what Pepperell tells us is that the posthuman era means the end of a human-centered universe. It also means the evolution of life, and he means both genetically and mechanically. Um, some people think that this means extinction of the human species, but that's not really what it means. The evolution of certain species doesn't necessarily mean the extinction of other species. Um, and third, it involves, the post-human era involves changes in how we live and really coming to view ourselves as interconnected within the larger world and enmeshed within a larger web of interconnection as opposed to seeing humans as sort of an island in the world. Um, now, in the broad scheme of things, there are a lot of different kinds of posthumanists. On one hand, we have sort of the pessimists, and these would be people like Francis Fukuyama and Paul Virilio, and they are really saying, oh no, it's the posthuman era, warning, warning, apocalypse, we really have to change certain things, and machines are getting too powerful, and it's all going haywire, you know. And there are a lot of people out there who feel this way. We see this all the time in science fiction movies. We've been seeing this since the 80s, right? The cautionary tale of technology getting out of hand, right? Um, and then, on the other hand, there are really kind of the more optimistic posthumanists, and these are people like Donna Haraway, Robert Pepperell, people who are really excited about the posthuman era, and they're really interested in the degradation of the concept of the human subject. They think this is a really wonderful, progressive, and fruitful evolution, um, and they also see it as something inevitable and something that's been going on for basically all of human history. And this ties into Donna Haraway's idea that human beings all are already cyborgs, right? So that is one way that in some ways we might be different from other animals because we are, of course, animals, but we're already in so many ways embedded with technology. So right now I'm wearing glasses, right? I'm talking to you through a computer, through the internet, and you know, my phone is basically tethered to my hand most of the time. And so many people have talked about how technology and tool using is an intrinsic part of being a human. She would say that, it, that very thing is what makes humans actually cyborgs. And so Donna Haraway doesn't really, as Benny noted, really use the term posthumanism, but she is considered kind of one of the founding mothers of this idea because she was the first person to really kind of point out the fact that this thing that we think is new, this kind of technological trajectory, has kind of been essential to the whole history of humanity, sort of as we know it. Um, then within kind of the, tr the posthumanism Optimists, the people who really, really like it, we have a couple different camps over there as well. And so on the one hand, we have what are called transhumanists. And these are people who 
are really looking for kind of biomechanical upgrades that will actually extend human life, maybe even to the point of immortality. So really looking to like literally embed our bodies with all different kinds of biotechnologies and putting their efforts toward finding out how to um, you know, it's like the ghost in the shell thing. How could we make our lives go on forever? And they tend to think of our brain as more of a computer and as our bodies more of a computer and thinking of consciousness as kind of an abstract electricity, sort of like the internet, and thinking of how we can really extend that, okay? But then on the other side, we have people who are really, really dedicated to embodiment. People like um, Catherine Hales and Catherine Hales and Karen Barad, who are really interested in materiality. They're really interested in the performativity of matter. Um, they wouldn't think that your consciousness could ever really be separate from your body. They believe in embodied knowing and the ways that our bodies actually enact our lives. And I would situate myself over on their side of it, right? Um, and so, of course... Posthumanism really has a lot to do with biotechnology. People are using all different kinds of posthuman theorists to either advocate for certain biotechnologies, against certain biotechnologies. Uh, we're, we really are coming close to the advent of forms of artificial intelligence. Um, actually, here at SIUC, where I go to school, there's actually a program in the math department, a master's program, specifically focused in artificial intelligence. So it's very real. Um, DMVs and lawmakers across the country are trying to right now create laws to prepare for the advent of automatic driving cars. So all of this stuff is very, very real. It's not some crazy thing out there, but it's really happening. But personally, I really am focused more on kind of the, the theoretical side of posthumanism. And like Benny, I'm really interested in what this has to say for social justice and what this has to say for kind of a critical understanding. And so in order to get to that side of posthumanism, I think it's really important to spend a moment exploring humanism. And so this is something that we do all the time. We find ourselves in kind of the post era, right? We're in postmodernism. And so we kind of say, ah, poo poo modernism. We're not into that. That's old hat. But in reality, you know, modernism had a lot of really interesting things to say. And if you really want to understand postmodernism, you kind of need to turn the pages back and see what some of that is coming out of. And so I really think it's important to try and not just completely throw away humanism, but to actually in some ways try to understand it. And so um, Mary Clages, who is a professor at the University of Denver, came up with nine ideas that she says are they're kind of like the nine enlightenment ideals, and they form the basis of both modernism and humanism. And so um, just to kind of, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but to give you an abbreviated explanation of these nine categories, I think is really important. So first, that there is a stable, coherent, knowable self, and that the self is conscious. Um, actually, that it's conscious, rational, autonomous, and universal. Two, this self knows itself and the world through reason. Three, the mode of knowing produced by the objective rational self is science. The knowledge produced by science is truth and is eternal. The knowledge slash truth produced by science by the rational objective knowing self will always lead towards progress and perfection. Reason is the ultimate judge of what is true. Therefore, what is right, what is good, what is legal, and what is ethical? In a world governed by reason, the true will always be the same as the good, the right, and the beautiful. Science thus stands as the paradigm for any and all socially useful forms of knowledge. Science is neutral and objective. 
Language, or the mode of expression used in producing and disseminating knowledge, must be rational also. There must be a firm and objective connection between the objects of perception and the words used to name them, between signifier and signified. Okay, now obviously, if you're watching this channel, you probably already know that some of those ideas have been critiqued and critiqued and critiqued over and over and over again, right? So we've done a lot of work to try and break down the autonomous rational objective self and talk about how we don't really think that's true and how things are a lot more complicated than that, right? So you're on board, I'm sure. But think about what these things have to say for being human. And posthumanism really tries to kind of point by point break down each one of these ideas, right? From a different kind of knowing that no longer elevates this idea of human to being autonomous, to being perfect, to being moved towards perfection through the acquisition of knowledge, through science, and through an objective form of language, right? All of these things really all work together. And so these being some of the major ideas of modernism as well as humanism, you can really see how postmodernism and posthumanism are very, very closely related. And so I really see posthumanism as kind of an arm of postmodernism, where we take kind of the ideas of postmodernism and we apply them to the idea of the human, to human rights, to what it means to be human or to no longer be human in an advancing technological world. And so, as I mentioned, this is really important when we think in terms of social justice and when we think in terms of human rights, okay? And Benny talked a lot about this in his video yesterday in regards to the Defense of Marriage Act, who has access to what rights, and how that configures people as maybe not being completely human and what that means. So, humanism did a lot of really positive things, right? It it was a secular way of kind of being able to be a good person, of being able to access truth without God, without having to adhere to the decisions of the church, which was really the ruling power, you know, back then. And so this was really, really important, but humanism still configures certain individuals as possessing full humanity and other individuals as not. I think that we can really see this um, to keep it, you know, seasonal. Yesterday was Columbus Day, right? Now, over the weekend, I just saw a play that was called Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, and it was kind of a historical comedic musical detailing the life of Andrew Jackson. And one of the things they talked about in that play was how historians are really conflicted between seeing Jackson, who, you know, as we all know, orchestrated the Trail of Tears. Historians really dispute whether to see him as possibly the greatest, one of the greatest American presidents, populism and cowboys and all of that jazz, versus seeing Jackson as the Hitler of the United States. You know, genocide and killing basically entire race of people. And I think the fact that we are even still conflicted over that kind of thing about whether or not he's the greatest or maybe he's a murderer and the fact that we still continue to celebrate Columbus Day as a nationally recognized holiday goes to show that we as a nation still do not fully recognize the humanity of indigenous Americans because in order to fully recognize them as humans, to really fully dissolve the idea of them being savages or primitive and to actually grant them full access as human beings would be to kind of take on a whole lot of guilt, to reconfigure the history of this country, and to really change a lot of things, right? And it would show us that that decision, which may have been rationally arrived at for what were seen as very legitimate reasons, was not the same as the truth, was not the same as what's beautiful, 
that things are really a lot more complicated and that sometimes what may be the rational decision in a given moment is completely irrational, completely evil, and will scar people, you know, for the rest of time. So that's just a little bit about Columbus Day and Andrew Jackson. Um, so I think that humanism is really important. It's actually what is central to posthumanism. It's not something that we totally want to get rid of. And so looking at that prefix of post, I really see post as in addition to, also, it does mean after, but it doesn't really mean instead of, right? So what posthumanism is doing is it's actually trying to take the ideals of humanism more seriously, try to configure them more broadly, and take a more critical approach to what we see as human rights. And, um, my video is already really long, so I'm going to cut it right there. And thank you so much for listening.